It all began with a group of workers who were moving earth for a new railway near Baghdad when they accidentally uncovered an ancient tomb. Archaeologists came to inspect the tomb and discovered that it was actually part of a Parthian settlement and they started to dig for buried treasures. And in 1936, during a regular excavation, a not so interesting looking 13 centimeter tall clay jar with a copper cylinder with an iron rod inside it was found and taken to the Baghdad Museum. But two years later, when an Australian painter named Wilhelm Koenig, who was then the director of this Baghdad Museum, took a closer look at this rather ordinary looking jar, he was so shocked and thrilled that he simply couldn't wait to announce to the world that what he had just discovered was possibly the world's oldest battery so old, in fact, that he predated Alessandro Volt's invention by a whole 2,000 years. But why the hell would he think that this was a battery? This is a battery. Most chemical reactions that take place in the world, such as when the tree makes fruit from photosynthesis or when your body converts sugars into energy, happen because the atoms involved are exchanging their electrons. In a similar way, a battery can create a circuit of electrons being exchanged between two conductors, which then results in electrical power. A conductor is an element that lets electrons move through it with ease. You know, metals are great conductors because, as opposed to a material like uh, plastic or rubber, their electrons are not bound to individual atoms and they can flow through the metallic composition. For a battery to work properly, one of its conductors needs to have a high tendency to lose its electrons and the other one to have less of that tendency. The more significant the difference between this attitude, the more effective the battery will be. An ionic substance, which is anything that has atoms with unstable electrons, which basically means an unequal number of electrons to its protons, is placed between these two conductors to kickstart a chemical reaction which results in this exchange of electrons. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about how batteries work, let's take a look back at our Parthian battery. As you can see, the cylinder was made of a thin sheet of copper that was foiled. There seems to be enough of a gap in this foil to allow whatever liquid might have been inside the jar to move inside it. The foil was then closed off at the bottom with a copper disc and sealed at the top with a layer of asphalt. And the iron rod was held suspended in the center of the cylinder by the upper asphalt plug. Iron is a metal that likes to lose its electrons a lot more than copper. And now all you would really need to make this into a battery is essentially an ionic substance inside the jar. And they're not as rare as you think. You know, vinegar, grape or lemon juice are only a few examples of ionic substances that were quite commonplace at the time. So Wilhelm theorized that this jar was actually filled with an ionic liquid and used as a battery to electroplate a layer of gold over metal. Obviously, his claims were rejected and, with the onset of the Second World War, forgotten. After the war, a new analysis revealed an acidic residue in the jar and signs of corrosion by an acidic substance on the iron rod. This gave a little bit of credence to Wilhelm's theory, and so interest in this bizarre jar was reignited once again. A physicist from the Science Museum in London went to Baghdad to examine this jar for himself. Impressed. He said that if they weren't batteries, then he wouldn't know what else they could be. In the same year, an American engineer filled a replica jar with grape juice and was able to produce about a volt of power. And then in the late 1970s, a German team used a string of these replica batteries to actually successfully electroplate a thin layer of silver. But I have to say, at this point, people have been stretching the limits of this theory too far. Electroplating requires an in-depth understanding of electricity that was only unsurfaced in the 1800s. And there is no evidence that multiple jars were ever connected together. Remember, no other identical jar like this one was found. Some similar looking jars were found somewhere else dating to the Sassanid period, but they didn't have all the elements. One of them had the bronze cylinder, but none of them had the iron rod, nor were there any wires found to connect the battery to anything else. And even if there were any wires, it's not clear how they could be connected to the copper part of the battery, which was covered in asphalt. And this is why most archaeologists and historians remain skeptical about these clay jars being batteries in the first place. Some of them theorize that they were simply scroll containers, as it was common to place scrolls in jars at the time. But really the shape, the size, and the fact that instead of any hint of papyrus or leather remains, an acidic residue was found inside the jar still makes you wonder. Yes, people didn't really have an expansive knowledge of electricity, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have accidentally invented a battery. In fact, all you really need to accidentally make a battery is a copper jar, an iron spoon, and some lemon juice or vinegar. So perhaps this was actually constructed and used as a novelty, rather than 
for any grand electrical designs like electroplating. At the time in Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean, healers used electrical fish to treat their patients. For example, there is a record of a Roman healer who would use an electrical fish to numb the pain of his patients who suffered from gout. Electric fish of one species or another were quite commonplace in the Mediterranean and the Nile, but not in the Persian Gulf or the Tigris Euphrates. So some archaeologists theorize that these old batteries were used as a substitute for these fish to give a mild electrical numbing sensation to people who wanted some pain relief. But also let's not gloss over the fact that some of these electrical fish were able to shock you with like voltages that go up to 600. Meanwhile, these Baghdad batteries could hardly muster one or two volts. Although the ancients didn't have our understanding of electricity, they still had some vague conception about the phenomena. They could observe the electrostatic powers that amber produced when it was rubbed against fabrics. And of course, they were very much aware of the magnetic powers of some strange rocks. For example, the Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder reports about an architect's plan to construct a suspended iron statue using magnetism. And it's very likely that priests and magicians at the time used rocks with magnetic properties to move and levitate trinkets and idols to awe and dazzle their audiences. Maybe the Baghdad battery with its meager voltage was used in a similar way as a magician's trick. Or maybe it was placed inside a religious idol to create a very weak electrical sensation when worshippers touched it. <gasps> In fact, one of the Sassanid jars was indeed found in what appears to be a magician's house. In the end, all we can do is speculate. For all we know, these Baghdad batteries could have just been some elaborate grape juice containers. And sadly, now uh, more than ever is an incredibly difficult time to determine what these clay jars were. But what pieces of the puzzle there were are now lost to us. That's right, in 2003, the Baghdad Museum was looted. Along with the 8,000 items that remain lost to us was the Parthian battery. And to this day, nobody knows where it is.